Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Racken, and welcome to Digital Rebar Provision Meetup number 36. Today is March 26th. It's finally springtime. We're going to kick off the spring with some interesting and fun and exciting discussions, and there's going to be prizes. And no, wait, no prizes. Sorry, everyone. Stickers. I was just seeing who's paying attention there. Stan, got a smirk out of Stan. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Uh, this is Shane. Like I said, we have uh, Rob and Greg online with us from Rackin, and we've got a nice uh, turnout from community. Today we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, it's going to be kind of a little bit of a scattered uh, discussion here, I think. Um, Greg is going to talk a little bit on some of our V313 uh, release info, which has been a long baking release. We've talked about it on and off a couple times in the last few meetups. Uh, but we're getting very close to uh, firing the oven up and, and uh, uh, setting it, so to speak. I don't know. I'm, I don't know where I'm going with that analogy, but it's coming close to being done. How about that? <laughs> and so we'll talk a little bit about all the features that are going into that. Uh, one of the things that slowed us down with that release is we've done a complete refactor and rewrite of the portal. And so the two uh, releases have been sort of going in tandem as we ironed out a new uh, baking of the portal as well as a relatively big uh, release version itself uh, on, on its own. One of the other really cool things we're going to talk about today is Net Wrangler. It's a product project tool that we started here in Racken to help us build configuration of network uh, interfaces so we have a consistent tool where we can define a network configuration that can ultimately apply that configuration to machines in different uh, format. So one of the examples would be systemd, networkd, uh, and then standard system files for CentOS, etc. So NetWrangler follows the netplan.io uh, structure for input definition, uh, but we wrote a new tool that writes it out to different backends across different distributions. So we have the consistency across uh, uh, different vendor distributions that we needed. Uh, we decided to pull that out as a separate component, and we're releasing that as a complete standalone uh, open source tool. We're hoping that there might be some traction gained around use, uh, use and usefulness of the tool. We'll go into a little bit more on that uh, as well. Uh, and then we had, have had some pretty spirit, spirited discussions on Ansible and Ansible use cases, and we're hoping to continue that with some of the folks on community here today. All right, so I think that's one of the longest ramblingest uh, um, introductions I've made for Meetup. <laughs> but uh, uh, let's see, uh, Greg, are you ready to talk a little bit about release note stuff? Or you want us to do Net Wrangler first? Whatever. I'm unmuted now. Fine. All right. Um, yeah, so let me. Yes. So, Greg, I, I forced Greg this morning to start wrapping up formal release notes, and it looks like he's gotten some of them going here. Oh, yeah, my God, good. there's a lot of stuff in here. Yeah, well, so that's the thing. So, if you just kind of put it in preview mode. Do, 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 do. Well, I haven't titled the release yet. Uh, we can make it up here in a minute, but the idea is that um, this is the uh, DRP release notes, kind of focused on what we changed in DRP. We'll have another one for the content packs, and I, we can talk about that a little bit, and then we'll reference the rack and plugin changes and stuff like that. Most of those are kind of described in here where they were changed. The plugins didn't undergo a huge change other than um, the ability to create data objects became much more standardized and vetted out. But we'll just run through some things. So basic API updates, a lot of uh, expansion around that plugin object system. So you can now get a list of the objects supported and, ex and exposed by plugins. Um, the objects themselves now have the ability to specify an endpoint of ownership. Um, this is going to be used for a whole set of functions around uh, multi-endpoint management. The idea is that you now have a manager of managers, as it were, 
And so those endpoint fields will get updated to allow for things like this DRP endpoint owns this object, but these other ones can take actions on it. Those kind of things become available. Um, we've added a ability for plugins to provide um, external auth endpoints. So we've added an Active Directory plugin that lets you integrate for like single sign-on kind of operations. And that's handled through a plugin system. So the front end now knows how to request auth actions and pass that through. Um, objects have been updated to report what they bundle or what bundle they're in so that you can query that. That was a, a, a community request to help with doing development around content packs. Um, let's see, uh, update events. This is more a programmatic thing. Um, contain the original object as well as the changed object so that uh, change differencing can occur. Um, we've updated the CLI and API not to have to use tokens. They use tokens by default, but you can put them in modes to not have to use tokens and always use the user. This is a slower operation, but allows you to do certain things where tokens might be not appropriate. Uh, the API also picks up a proxy streaming capability so that um, DRPs can be chained. This allows us to do things like um, kind of remote edge style DRP management. The idea is that uh, one manager might be able to connect into a DRP and then that can then control DRPs through that secondary DRP. Um, so again, part of the manager function that we're starting to expose from rack in. Um, tasks now have the ability to specify prerequisites, uh, prerequisite tasks. So Victor added the support to, around the idea that, um, and this was coming up in a few cases around like hardware configuration and such, where we have one task that needs the hardware tools. And then we have another task that needs the hardware tools. And a lot of times those were specified by separate stages. And so you ended up having like to run the hardware and ins tools install tasks like four times because RAID needed it and BIOS needed it and other stuff. This prerequisite allows you to say, well, this task requires this task to be run at some point in my future and will conditionally add it if it hasn't already been added to the task list. That way you can reduce multiple operations and stuff. Um, we've added and changed some of the CLI functions. There's now a generate password hash function on the CLI so that you can use that to generate content packs for users um, and di distribute your users in a coordinated match, uh, manner. Uh, DR the DRP CLI also looks for a uh, .DRP CLI RC, kind of like a NetRC file that allows you to specify the RS parameters so you don't have to necessarily pollute your environment with them. Um, Go high part of DRP CLI was updated to include disk and controller information. So now you also have disks and controllers attached to the system along with network devices and memory and all of that stuff. Um, the DRP CLI also picked up the ability to integrate with the SAS catalog. So you can install content directly from the DRP CLI uh, command line from the catalog without having to go through the UI. So this can help you with automated deployments and stuff. Um, DRP CLI can also be told not to use tokens. Again, it can be useful in certain cases where tokens have been invalidated and you need to be able to still access this system. Um, the files and ISO commands were updated to take URLs directly. And then as we'll talk about here in a minute, DRP CLI now includes Net Wrangler. So Net Wrangler is our new project that lets you build um, configure, network configuration files based upon a certain structure and generate those out into the system. This allows you to do like post install uh, NIC bonding and VLAN configuration and uh, external IP configuration and stuff like that. And we'll talk about more of that in a little bit. Um, some server updates, we disambiguated the DRP ID and HA ID fields so that these can be actually valid so that you can have a DRP ID that represents the DRP, but an HA ID that would represent like a pair of DRPs. Um, we also uh, added an API endpoint to automatically update DRP. So you can now 
do an admin level call to say, here's my new zip file, update myself and restart in place. Um, all server options are now settable through environment variables, which enables um, DRP customization and production mode through the systemd drop-in kind of style. So instead of having to edit the systemd service file yourself, you can now configure those through environment variables and drop them in. Um, we had a huge set of changes in content packs. So your previous content packs will continue to work, but there's some new uh, sets of abilities. Content packs now have the ability to specify, pre specify prerequisites. So you can say like this content pack depends on this other content pack at this version or higher. That way DRP can make sure that those are present and then fail and those kind of things. Um, content packs now have the ability to import and export secure data, either in a raw mode or you can then also lock a content pack with a key so that that can sit there encrypted at rest and then import as needed with that key. Um, content packs also now have richer metadata this is often reflected in the catalog right now, but across the board, you can use that and see that in your own operations as well. Things like license specifications, locations, more version information, stuff like that. And then uh, as part of the prerequisite work, Victor went through and cleaned up um, some of the validation so we can get better errors and more effective errors. And also, like I said, add the prerequisite validation itself. Let's see, plugin updates. Um, We've, while in uh, the previous release, plugins had the ability to add storage objects. Um, in this release, it gets much more uh, vetted, validated, fixed. Objects are much, are searchable now. They're indexed, they're archived. I mean, they have the full API access control. So for example, the pooling plugin and the manager plugin will use, will uses this object system to add new objects that are searchable through the API and controllable. Um, so that's a much richer system now. Um, and I just talked about those and those objects also end up generating events and all of the things that you expect from the normal API system. We've also updated plugins and plugin providers to properly restart on license changes and additions and removals as well as um, token invalidation. So that when the plugins, you might actually lose access to them or gain access to them depending on how the licenses are available or if tokens change, this now takes care of that starting it. Um, a whole lot of doc updates across the board, kind of a lot of what we talked about above, plus some additional information about rebooting, um, image references, stuff like that. All that's been updated. And then um, again, licensing updates on our side, um, making some things more visible, more accurate. And then some testing updates, um, strangely enough, you can now directly go compile DRP provision and run that as a, um, without the embedded assets so that you can do like go build DRP provision and we'll actually build. And you can then use that in testing for direct testing and stuff. So we use that for example, for some of our new plugin unit tests, as well as the Terraform provider uses it to uh, validate itself. Um, bug fixes. We had a bunch of non-determinism in the unit test. Those have been mostly resolved. We updated uh, to a new Go archiver. There were some issues in that, so that's been updated. We fixed uh, two or three DHCP issues from the community around proxy mode, as well as uh, stripping vendor information too quickly. Um, changed some of the plugin validation of tokens. Installed SH got updated. Um, uh, we had an issue where plugins, if you specify plugins with parameters, those parameters, if they had defaults, weren't being used by the plugin. So if you actually specified a parameter default, the plugin was ignoring it. This fixes that. And then we also fixed the issue from the community where um, they wanted to specify a single IP and an active range for a subnet that's been resolved. Blah. So that's all the DRP changes. Um, I don't think I'll let questions be asked at this point. Um, no. Any questions on that so far? I don't have questions, but um, it's obviously a lot of stuff, <laughs> a lot of good stuff. Um, I really like that we've added the self update self process. That's really going to help dramatically for automation and management. Uh, I know it was added for other reasons as well, but <coughs> just general one off use outside of the multi endpoint manager 
it's going to be a really good addition. The content catalog is huge. Uh, it was a real pain in the ass to automate uh, getting content and uploading used content. To be, used to be a pain in the ass. It used to be, yes, yes, yes. And well, so um, the catalog is, is an amazing uh, enhancement that makes things so much easier. The interesting thing about the catalog is while we use it for our SaaS deployment, we've actually enabled you to specify your own catalogs. So you can build exactly. your own catalog of your own content yeah. and through some extra flags, pass that in. And then as the manager stuff gets more exposed, uh, you'll see that the catalog entries are actually a content pack that are loadable into DRP as content items, catalog items, so that you can actually do your own versioning and aggregated catalog of both rack in public and uh, your own content into a single catalog view, if you will. Um, real quick on the content packs, um, the community versions of the content packs, uh, we'll have updates for the OSs that are out of date here shortly. I mean, that's in the content already. Um, we'll also expose Sledgehammer Builder. So that is now an open sourced component so that you can see how and what Sledgehammer is built. And if you so choose, build it yourself. Good luck. <laughs> there, there are some good use um, cases for that if someone wants to build a sort of a immutable image of some sort with baked in application that you can boot straight into um, and basing off of Sledgehammer as a, an example. And then one of the biggest set of changes in the community content is actually driven by uh, Benjamin Runnels and Adam Lemansky, Lemansky, however you say that. Um, they have both been really active on trying to build out crib support. Um, both of them taking slightly different tacks, but that's been mostly um, contained and complementary. Um, so Runnels has finished and provided patch requests to do things like self-healing HA, etcd, and crib clusters. So as managers are destroyed or rebooted, the things get clean and stuff like that. Um, and Lemonsky has been working on, or Adam has been adding support for certs and cert extensions and um, kind of more production ready um, certification cert kind of access. Those kind of things are also, we're including in the content packs and making available. Um, in that pass. On the rack and plugin side, um, the hardware plugins now have um, our first pass at HP support. So if you're looking at playing with some of that, that's available. Um, we've been adding and fixing some bugs around some of the IPMI stuff, though there's still many to find, I'm sure. Um, like I mentioned, Active Directory support as a plugin is available now, as well and as initial. Which app. gives us the ability to add LDAP as a backend off as well, pretty easily. It still yeah. needs to be added in, but all of the uh, code hooks for it have been added with the Active Directory work. Yep. And let's see, final set. Um, yeah, the plugin insanity. Um, Oh, with regard to the HP support, um, that also has the implication that the RAID subsystem has been updated to support the HP Smart Array um, beyond the um, whatever. And then at some point, we'll probably want to talk about manager and a separate thing. It's still in the baking process, but shows up as a thing that could be played with, but there's still much more work to do there, at least from a documentation and control perspective. Uh, oh, and then the final item is a whole UX update rewrite. Not rewrite, but... <laughs> it's not, um, it really sounds super scary. The back end changed a ton. Yeah. the Most of the internal pages stay and look the same. Uh, some stylistic changes, but some big updates around the content pack to take advantage of the, con the catalogs mm -hmm. so that you can control and get better views on your plugins and content packs. And then the coalescing of the bulk action page and the machines page into a single view. We were finding that almost everybody used bulk actions and nobody used the machines view. And so let's just make that one. And so there's a whole lot of changes around usability and increased visibility on that page.
Um, and then just general operational back end internal guts of the UX that improve that don't necessarily have visible side, but should help with performance of loading and other stuff. Yeah. So it's a lot faster. Uh, per and parameter have we, have we worn Greg out yet? Greg, have we worn you out yet? Oh, yeah, almost. Oh, 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 almost. All right, go ahead. The UX also, one of the things that I'm really happy that Rob got in is the updated parameter editors. Mm. They're much more effective at showing types and validation and control. So I think that's going to be a big use. The, yeah, they're, they're much prettier. They, they, they reward you for specifying types, even enums. If you yeah. have an enum type, it'll respect that. Um, yeah, overall, there's a yeah, it, it, That's a nice ad, getting the pick lists off the enums automatically. So you can put the right things in there without having to go look it up. Um, the, other, the other thing that's not at all obvious to people is that there's actually a CI system now behind the UX. So all changes are CI'd. Oh, and then the other thing that's useful is we just, uh, you know, stomped out all of the nits and warnings that the console was was throwing. So um, UX doesn't create a lot of console chatter. If you uh, if you go looking for oh what happened, it'll it'll actually be much much cleaner all around. It's a, there's a, a lot of <laughs> a lot of code. The UX can be played with now at the uh, tip.rackin.io site. It's a parallel site to portal.rackin.io, but it tracks our tip changes. You can play with that there as well. It, it, it's worth noting though that we uh, changed the entitlements. So if uh, for we we support twenty community free users get twenty up to twenty machines in the in the system. If you have more than twenty machines, we also added a lower tier license. Uh, for people who just need UX support and IPMI access. So if you have more than 20 machines in your DRP, you need to be prepared. So there we go. Okay. I have Babel and I'm sure there's a, yep, I'm sure there's a lot more in there that we've missed too, um, <laughs> but that's the broad brush stroke. That's amazing. There's a, a lot of features and enhancements in this uh, release. Uh, we're hoping uh, to get that out soon. Greg, end of, end of thoughts week on timeline? Gonna end of week, it's got to be. Oh, I'm in my right. lifetime. No, um, hopefully by the end of the week, we'll get something out. Hopefully by the end of the week, look for 313 to hit your uh, doorsteps. Yeah. Um, All right. Yeah. A quick note on that, though, as purveyor of the versioning, um, our intent is to push this out, but given Racken's focus is on some manager stuff, we will probably be cranking versions a little more often um, in the short term to address issues that come around up around multi-node management. Um, it, we've isolated and separated that functionality out, and if General tried to not make it part of core DRP to keep the restrictions and keep things from impacting just normal usage, just as a code separation control point, but we occasionally have to update DRP for things like that. We hopefully have gotten most of that through, but things like the UX and content packs and other things like that may rotate a little faster here for the next couple months as we get that vetted out and improved. Excellent. Anything else, Greg? Oh, I'll stop now. <laughs> All right, you get them on a roll. You can't stop them sometimes. It's a huge <laughs> and the, and it'll and some of these features uh, will will make a ton of sense when we we haven't previewed manager at all. So uh, there's things that you'll be like, oh, aren't obvious otherwise. All right. Sorry, Go so ahead. moving on, Net Wrangler we. <laughs> Net Wrangler we mentioned was a feature that was born out of our need to be able to apply standard configuration changes to network interfaces and addressing. So across the different Linux distros and time streams and variations and versions and systemd and uh, Ubuntu, uh, Red Hat versus Debian style configurations, it's a real mess. 
out there to try and configure networks. And a lot of our customers and a lot of our community members have run into that pain and suffering trying to figure out once you've got a machine discovered, how you can apply configuration to make the network uh, stable and look the way you need it to look for your environment. And the answer for DHCP, it's easy. Just use us for DHCP. That's easy. Create a reservation if you want it long lived, but that doesn't work for everybody. And so out of that frustration, we look for tools to try and, and make that journey easier in general. We came across NetPlan, uh, which comes out of Canonical. Uh, we liked the syntax that NetPlan came up with, the, essentially the DSL, if you will, for describing the configuration you want to apply to the devices. But all in all, the implementation left us a little bit needing or wanting for more. Uh, so NetWrangler was born as a mechanism by which to consume the DSL for NetPlan's uh, description of uh, port configurations, network configuration, and addressing, and then is a single Golang binary, as is our style. Uh, it's a standalone, statically compiled binary now that allows you to apply the NetPlan syntax to make a network configuration so. It's also pluggable from the perspective that it'll support multiple configuration styles. Right now, it has a relatively limited list of configuration styles, specifically system D, network D, uh, variation and uh, Red Hat slash CentOS style configuration files. But one of the things that we felt was NetWrangler is a pretty cool tool. We like it and we think that it has some real uh, opportunity for general use case, not just within the context of digital rebar provision, but for other people trying to automate, build, and provision their environment. And so we released Net NetWrangler as a standalone component. Uh, you can find it at netwrangler.io, uh, relatively easy to find. Uh, and there's a bit of an introduction page that l sort of gives you some information and background on it, uh, how to use it. Uh, we'll add a little bit more help to the using NetWrangler with some example usage parameters, uh, some decent uh, information on building NetWrangler to get your own NetWrangler binary if you're using it as a separate component. Uh, remember that uh, Greg just mentions in that really long list of things he just reeled off, uh, DRPCLI also embeds NetWrangler capability native into DRPCLI. So in the next upcoming release, you don't need NetWrangler as a standalone component uh, necessarily. Uh, so you'll get all of that as automagic uh, goodness, tastiness in the next release. Um, but if you wanted to build it for your own, particularly if you want to just do some standalone testing of applying network configurations before you implement that within your own uh, DR digital rebar provision uh, flows, that's a good use case for that. Uh, compiles relatively easily. You can cross compile it for different architectures and platforms. Some cross compiling notes here, standard Golang uh, cross compiling uh, operates here. So that means there's a, a wide range of processor architectures and OS distributions that it can be cross-compiled for. Uh, last, well, not necessarily last, but most importantly, um, we're hoping that community finds this useful and would like to contribute back to it. Um, we tend to make things work for the implementations that we run into with our customer engagements and some of the broader set feature requirements that community needs as sort of a, we hear over and over. But there are a lot of you that are going to have use cases out there that are just very specific. Uh, you may have a fleet of machines that you need to configure a certain way or in a certain style. And so we're making this available so it should be hopefully easy to extend and embrace NetWrangler to support those additional styles with the same front end DSL that you can use for multiple uh, outputs. So, you know, System D, Network D, Red Hat, uh, Debian style. Uh, whatever that the, the specific style of configuration in this potentially can be extended to Windows based networking since NetWrangler will compile for Windows OSs. So those of you who may need to wrangle with Windows, uh, there's an opportunity to create a single tool for applying network configuration across a whole fleet of differing things. Um, we are asking that people sign a contributor license agreement. Uh, it just helps uh, ensure that the organization, the NetWrangler open source pieces are a long lived piece that is well governed through the license itself and the contributor license engagement. 
It's a very easy process. It's uh, detailed on the README page as well. Uh, let us know if you have any questions with that. And then some other tidbits of information that are sort of important if you start going down the path of NetPlan. Uh, the project is obviously hosted on GitHub and it's Rackn slash NetWrangler. Um, when you start looking to get started, you're, you need to know what the NetPlan stuff looks like uh, or what the configuration input files will look like. Fortunately, there's a test-data directory structure which has a long list of example configurations. So these are really great for getting you started. So for example, if you wanted to look at bonding configuration, look at the NetPlan YAML uh, structure and you'll see that it's a relatively easy to understand and digest uh, YAML structure that allows you to apply the configuration. The NetWrangler tool itself will help you with the interface assignments uh, as part of the usage. Uh, that'll get some updates in the documentation here soon. But basically, there are a number of configuration uh, types and examples here that should really help you get started. You can also go to netplan.io for their reference documentation. So there's a lot of good reference documentation there on how that configuration information, et cetera, et cetera, looks. Um, what else? Am I missing anything there? Give it a whirl. Give it a try. Let us know how it goes. If you run into issues, if you look at adding extensions or capabilities or features or have problems with it, we'd love to get some feedback as we start embracing um, broader use case and, and hardening that Wrangler for multiple configurations and environments. I guess that's it. Any questions from community or comments or thoughts from community on that? Do, 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 I was, was going to suggest do, if do, you wanted to go through do. some use cases, Shane, of like what would be a good place to start or a typical thing that somebody would try to do. Uh, well, I, I'm assuming a typical use case scenario would be you have an existing configuration environment that you want to replicate. And so you'll want to take a look at what that looks like, what your network configuration looks like. Take a look at the test data uh, and see if we have an, a matching sort of configuration uh, plan in place already. Uh, also should mention that test data is called test data because we use that within the CICD uh, testing tooling to verify and validate NetPlan itself. So we know these are good working configurations and these are good starting points. So for example, if you want to set up uh, VLANs with bridging, there's the bridge VLAN uh, configuration. If that matches your network environment, that gives you a good idea of what the NetPlan uh, YAML syntax looks like. Uh, and then from there, uh, driving the NetWrangler tool through collecting your interface information and applying the plan configuration to generate the output configuration files and seeing how those work. Um, there is a bit of missing uh, usage information around those examples. There's the usage, uh, the help output that's uh, on the web page as well, as well as the dash dash help output from the binary itself. Um, but we'll get a couple of examples of real world usage of how to uh, run and get your input format and identify your physical devices and how to use and tie all of those pieces together on the NetWrangler site itself. Uh, that'll be embedded uh, in the documentation here pretty soon, hopefully. Um, it looks like we scared Rob off. Hi, Rob. It's nice seeing you. Uh, so that that's sort of a quick summary of usage, uh, sort of overview plan, uh, process, I guess. Um, any yeah. questions? And if oh, you have Rob's back, darn. If you have questions, um, Victor wrote most of it. Okay, all of it. So um, if you're looking for mindset, questions, control, rants, raves, all those things. Um, talk to Victor. Ooh, and someone in, yeah, the, and someone in the chat just asked if uh, Network ever being able to do switch configs. Um, I don't know that NetWrangler directly would be able to do that. The tool is sort of optimized for writing out uh, OS specific uh, network configs or you know, Linuxy, Rally type things. Um, 
adding capability for it to go in and uh, you know slam a config onto a switch, that'd be a pretty significant extension. Um, it it seems like it'd be entirely possible to generate an output that would be apl applicable to a switch. Um, that would be sort of a plugin, but I haven't checked the Netplan format to see if it is uh, has all the necessary uh, stanzas to be able to handle, you know, the network type configs that you throw onto a switch. It's more optimized for what you would throw onto a server. So, yeah. So, Craig. In some regards, the intent wasn't necessarily to generate a set of um, str string command or command outputs to generate that. Uh, oh, I see. Well, so two things. Network Angular's intent is to actually generate the configuration files that will be used by the operating system post install. So that way, the idea is that Net Wrangler would then build the config files based upon the configuration needed for the OS that's run. And then as the machine boots into that OS, either through KEXEC or normal reboot, that networking takes effect. Um, with regard to using it, like, could it be used to generate SSH port commands, right? Um, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> uh, I'd have to have one or some pretty thorough documentation on what all the output formats need to look like. Um, and of course, uh, if it gets too in depth, you know, that'd probably be a paid support engagement or a place to, or something along those lines. Yeah, I mean, in some regards, we've always had a, on the rack inside, a vision of either treating the switch itself as a machine with a uh, proxy runner to drive that, and then that would handle the translation of net plan into SSH actions or whatever. You could use Napalm or something like that, or a plugin in DRP where um, tasks ask for switching operations to be occurred as part of or as part of the task flow. Um, to generate the appropriate switch configure operation commands. Um, in some regards, those are more controllable in our current models and how we would probably start thinking about it versus trying to bake that into Net Wrangler. Just from a operational flow perspective, Net Wrangler doesn't know about any of the workflow stuff going on, right? So. Yeah, right now it's just a tool, you know, take a config on the input and spit out config files on the output. And that's pretty much its entire scope right now. The fun part is uh, making sure we spit out all the interesting networking things and all, with all the interesting parameters people want. And so okay. right. I'm not smart enough to answer your question. Um, It's, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> and, uh, Craig, uh, it won't work for old old style Debian config files yet. Although I do have uh, plans in the roadmap to add support for it. It's mostly just a limitation. Or it's mostly just you know what would, what have we mostly been using recently, and that's all been System D, Network D, and uh, for CentOS six type stuff, the old school rel, rel syntax configuration files. Yeah. Uh, um. Sebastian, if you're hearing me, let hit bring that up in Slack and I can attempt to walk through what that might look like. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Uh, if there are no other comments, questions around Net Wrangler, we'll move over to uh, Ansible use case. So, Dating back to V34 and V35, the last two meetups, we've had sort of an ongoing discussion um, around use case people. Are, how are people using Ansible in relation to digital rebar provision? How does uh, our profiles and parameter structures relate to uh, groups in Ansible and general uh, Ansible use case patterns? Um, so opening the floor up for questions or comments or thoughts about around that conversation.
everybody's done with Ansible. They finally moved on. <laughs> finally realized that salt stack is the best way to go. Oh my gosh. Do, no, not, no, listen. No. Do not listen to that. Yeah. We want a mixture of chef and puppet everywhere. <laughs> Often on the same machine. Uh, we believe everybody should have to suffer through all provisioning systems. For, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, if, if it's worth reminding people the place we left off was the dilemma with how to put things in groups um, and mapping the, the thing that gets really really ugly is uh, mapping ansible's nested group hierarchies into uh, which people seem to love to build uh, playbooks that require um, in back into digital rebar which intentionally has a flat uh, profile system. So doing it with just profiles and one level of groups is not 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 that mind bending. It's when you need nested uh, groups that it gets really sort of crazy. Um, and then we, we sort of think about it backwards because sorry, profiles. Uh, I don't think yes, guys correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there's an easy way to take to show all the machines that, are, that have a profile. You, you sort of have to uh, no the, wait there there is we've added something for that um, did we uh, well, the indexes it, handle a whole bunch of stuff but there's no where there's no there's no uh, wild carding in the index so you could see all the machines that have a list of profiles but not all yeah that have a profile I don't I, think well I don't think we have a native command that does that but JQ will do that um, relatively easily for you. As far as JQ is relatively easy. <laughs> yeah, the dynamic inventory stuff, though, you have to, you're writing it with API calls. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I don't remember. We have added a bunch of stuff in the indexing things for uh, the CLI and API, and I don't remember which ones. Yeah, and, and for people who are, who are, uh, we have a couple of people in, in the chat. This is a very narrow discussion of what, what we mean by Ansible because uh, it's not about installing DRP with Ansible. Uh, I know there's a couple of people doing that and it's not about the tower integration, which is about calling jobs from a workflow. Um, and it's not even about running uh, Ansible locally on a machine as part of a, a, part of a workflow. Uh, the, <laughs> what we're talking about with this is um, generating inventory files from the uh, DRP NP API, which there's a example code, some example code for, so that you can do a play uh, dash I for dynamic inventory from a Python file and then run the play. Um, so that the, the first use case we did for that was Coop spray. And it caused us because cube spray used nested groups it caused us to have to create some really wacky um, profile data mess stuff that i'm not, not a fan of um, but you can you could easily take a profile and and you know we have ways that we list machines inside of, in parameters inside of profiles like for kubernetes all the time uh, so it's not it's you know not hard to conceive of that just not very natural from a DRP perspective. These are, good, these are good questions. We want to make it easier to use Ansible. We're just trying to find what people are trying to do with it. Um, where, 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 they, where people want to go. In some cases, the, the suggestion I would have is just run Ansible local as part of a staged workflow instead of trying to run it um, external to the system. But, uh, let's see, Craig. Uh, Craig. Oh, Yusuf had a question in uh, chat okay. uh, about yeah, uh, Ansible versus Tower uh, in local Ansible playbook. And that's actually a good question because that's one of the questions we had was the patterns people are using. Mm -hmm. um, we do support uh, Tower that we have a Tower plugin that allows you to do more advanced things through Tower. Um, so we're looking for feedback on your use cases around all of that. Yeah. 
our use case is uh, we, we primarily use AWX uh, Ansible for uh, auditing and role-based access controls across various different playbooks and who can execute it and who executed it at what time, uh, whether from the CIC CD system or from uh, the console access to it. So. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Stan, is that Tower or just Ansible? AWX. Tower. AWX. Tower doesn't exist. AWX. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, AWX has a lot more controls. Sorry, some of us are stuck in the past with Ansible. As, never mind. No more <laughs> Ansible don't, bashing. Don't stop talking. We like hearing your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, if there's no other conversation threads around Ansible for the moment, um, oh, we can uh, wrap. Chris, trees, no, the, the crib stuff that's being done doesn't use Ansible at all. It's all uh, internal tasks. Assault, and Sebastian had a salt stack question. Yeah. We did some salt stack integrations a while ago. That's Shane's still a fan. Uh, yeah, Sebastian, so uh, go ahead, go ahead, Shane. I, yeah, I was just going to say so salt stack is uh, we don't have a direct integration at the moment. Um, I did start some a while back, but I never got to finishing it. Uh, the integration that I was looking at with salt stack was to be able to help deploy the minion. Uh, on machines as part of a standard workflow process, not very hard to integrate it, as well as standing up a salt stack master and then tying the, or helping with the cert process of authenticating the minions back to the master. That's always been sort of the sticking point people have had with salt stack is the, the getting things started between uh, salt stack uh, masters and minions and everybody points to the Ansible um, agentless uh, fallacy that uh, Ansible doesn't require an, uh, an agent on the remote side, which is not true. There is an agent, it's just SSH being reused as an agent. Um, salt stack also does support that now, obviously with the salt SSH uh, process. Uh, but if there is interest around uh, salt stack, uh, I would be happy to revive that work that I had started because I like salt stack. And I like that it's an actual real operational tool, not just a configuration management tool. Uh, it's both combined and it's designed for massive scale, which is what digital rebar provision is designed for as well. Uh, it's much more uh, functional and scale environments of uh, over 500 to 1,000 nodes without doing crazy work to try and mitigate the run times and performance impact problems that Ansible has at scale, in my opinion. <laughs> Not your opinion. It's widely known. Yes, I know you can. <laughs> and, and I know there. You can certainly administer many thousands of nodes with Ansible, with lots of uh, gyrations and considerations and and smart breaking out and how you do it. But if you try and do that through uh, things like a single tower or single AWX instances, you start getting into lots and lots of problems. And run times for Ansible playbooks tend to be extremely long comparative to uh, salt stacks uh, capability to do things quickly. They're, they're trade offs for both sides, for sure. Yeah, no, it's just S using SSH as your control mechanism is going to be a, a long slog in scale. Okay, excellent. Uh, any last thoughts or comments from community before we wrap things up? I'm hungry. It's lunchtime for me here on the West Coast. Um, <laughs> so I'm eager to get in at a five minute head start. <laughs> all right, well, we'll wrap things up, everybody. Appreciate all of your time. Uh, love seeing you on community. Uh, we don't have an agenda set for uh, 37 yet in two weeks, which will be April 9th, I think. Um, but we should have uh, v313 rolled out the door. So hopefully we'll have some in the field experience with that. Um, we did have some potential crib content 
from one of our uh, more prolific crib uh, committers. Uh, we're hoping that Benjamin Runnels may be available to show what he's been doing with his self-healing cluster stuff. He's done some really interesting work. Uh, not sure if he's going to be available on that date yet. So we're looking forward to that as a possibility. Uh, we'll hopefully, we might possibly have some input on the manager plugin uh, and maybe some conversation about multi endpoint management. If anyone's interested in the rack and commercial side of things on that. Um, lots of interesting things. Uh, Sebastian will follow up. Um, he had a question here. Yes, yeah, so we'll follow up on Pound Community, Sebastian, with you on the uh, DNS Raspberry Pi question you have. Um, you're in our community, correct? Just making sure on that. Yes, okay, excellent. We'll follow up on community there with those questions. I think that's a good question. Uh, definitely something we'll wanna to touch on. It's gonna take a little bit more time to go through than the last few minutes we have here. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. We'll see you in two weeks and have a good week.